Utah and the ACC, I cannot see it. You are Locked On College Football, your daily podcast on all things college football. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On College Football. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view every day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your daily source to stay up to date with the biggest stories in the greatest sport on planet Earth, realignment, coaching, carousel, the portal, and more. We've always got you covered. Lots coming up today. Ole Miss and UCLA making a little bit of noise. Really like what Ole Miss just did. But... Uh, report came, we'll just call it a tweet because that's really what it is, uh, from Dick Weiss. Now, he has been a longtime sports journalist and columnist, and he tweeted out the following and then just kind of left it there, which is part of the reason I have my doubts. But he tweeted the following, quote, Speculation is circulating about potential shifts in college sports conferences. There is discussion about, you yeah, know, way, there is discussion about Utah possibly moving to the ACC Despite its recent move to the Big 12, with some suggesting the ACC might be a better fit due to its ESPN network agreement and potential for increased TV value. However, skepticism exists regarding the stability and attractiveness of the ACC compared to the Big 12. End quote. So, uh, Dick Weiss has been a long time, his Twitter bio reads, like this National Sports Writers Hall of Fame, Kurt Gowdy Award, award-winning columnist for New York Daily News, covering college basketball for eight thousand years. I got to give him props. That's pretty. That's a pretty funny bio there. But I have my doubts that this would happen. Now, one of the reasons I have my doubts is throughout all of this realignment saga over the last couple of years, the guys who have been the most reliable there there have been some women as well for sure nicole auerbach over at the athletic but the places where i look for realignment news to talk about here on the show ross dellinger dennis dodd pete thamel those are kind of, that's kind of the golden trio for me now look i i don't know dick weiss he i'm i have he could be a great guy for all i know i'm i'm sure he is if he's had a, a lengthy career in sports media here but I can't see this taking place because of what he mentioned at the end. The stability of the ACC does not exist. There is no stability. I've talked about it many times here on the show. It's all instability, unknown, uncertain futures. I don't know why you would leave that if you're Utah. Now, I'll play devil's advocate here for a moment and speak about why you could think about this, and maybe I'd be incorrect in uh, my my prediction here of, no, I don't think you're going to wind up going to the ACC. Utah has an out that I mentioned a while back on the show in their clause with the Big 12. They are not as contractually obligated to being in the Big 12 as other members are. For example, when Colorado first left the Pac-12 and went to the Big 12, they signed a 99-year grant of rights. Utah did not do that. Now, the that that comes with some some consequences for the Utes, which is they're not as influ- influential in terms of their voting capacity as every other member of the Big 12, but it could allow them to get out of the Big 12 if they deem that to be the most desirable situation. The second part of why this maybe could have teeth to it possibly, is that Utah never wanted to be in the Big 12. Utah is in the Big 12 because they have to be. They were content to sign on to a Pac-12 without Colorado. They were, I think, willing to do that. They were not a big realignment piece. There was plenty of chatter about, well, the Utah, you know, all the four corner schools are going together. Nope. Utah went when Oregon and Washington left for the Big Ten, they said, all right, now we're out of options. We can't have a power conference here without Oregon and Washington. In it. Like, we, we, we can't do it. Got to go to the Big 12. So they're in the Big 12. But it was pretty clear throughout the whole Pac-12 saga and the, the month since that Utah is, is not exactly where they'd like to be. It's where they have to be. Still, despite those two factors... I'm not giving this a lot of weight right now. I, I really am not. And that's why I brought it up on, on the show because I got a couple messages about it and it was, you know, flying around and 
everybody's I'm sure heard of it by the time you're listening to or watching the show, or maybe you haven't. That's why you tune into the show, which I appreciate you doing. But I just think about going to the ACC and it's like, why, why would you go to a conference? Not that the Big 12 is the most desirable place to be. It's not. That's the Big 10 or the SEC. Right now, though, what the Big 12 has is what the ACC cannot provide, and that is stability and assurance. The Big 12 does not have any schools that the Big 10 and SEC are going to come after. They don't have any schools who are going to sue to break the 99-year grant of rights and get into one of the Power 2 conferences. They don't have that capability. They don't have those sorts of schools. Does not mean there are not plenty of good schools in there. Are they Big 10 SEC caliber in realignment to make a move? Absolutely not. Not even close. Heck, Utah would frankly be one of the teams near the top of that list. But I don't think that that desire exists. Like the Big 10 SEC desire for expansion is already up for debate right now. A while back, I had on Chris Gordy of Locked On SEC, and he stated on the show that, you know, Greg Sankey, the commissioner of the SEC, has been public that they don't really want to expand any further, which is why I would lean towards Clemson and Florida State if they're able to get out of the ACC going into the Big Ten. But neither one of those conferences needs to expand. They would only go after schools like FSU and Clemson that are you know, kind of too good to pass up. But nobody like that exists in the Big 12, which is why it's stable. It doesn't mean it's a great place to be. The revenue gap is only going to grow because the SEC and the Big 10 are pulling away from everybody. In the Big 12, they can't keep up. They have got a deficit to deal with there, and they're not going to be able to close that gap. However... They are solidifying themselves in what they do have. And that's the challenge for Jim Phillips in the ACC right now is he can't go to his member base and assure them of anything. He can go and say, yep, the ACC, we're trying to keep Florida State and Clemson around. We have no incentive to settle. We're not going to negotiate. We're not going to do this and everything like that. I don't know that he was screaming in that particular tone, but that's just you know kind of the way that it, it was received when he said, well, we have no incentive to settle. We're not going to do that. All right, he's going to fight out, try to keep them into the ACC. But if he doesn't do that, that opens the door for North Carolina, Miami, Duke, NC State, anybody else to look at the options of leaving the conference. No one's trying to get out of the Big 12 because they're just they're just being real. The Big 12 is being real and honest with themselves. Every member in that in that conference is, yeah, we uh we're just here. We're here. Happy to be here. We like the Big 12. Good conference. It's the third league, but it beats being the fourth. It beats being Oregon State, Washington State, who would kill to be in the Big 12 right now. So I I can't see it. Uh, I, I saw this and was just kind of thrown for a loop thinking, what, why? Why would they go? Wait, what's the benefit? And certainly, that's not a move that could take place before you know what's happening with FSU and Clemson. Because Utah is a, a growing national football brand. They're not on Florida State and Clemson's level. That wouldn't be a one-to-one replacement from a television market standpoint or a brand standpoint. And I, I, I really like Utah, and I think they'd be fairly desirable. If FSU and Clemson were forced to stay, I think this could have more weight to it. But we still don't know if that's going to take place. I have my doubts the ACC is going to be able to keep them around. And as I talked about last week on the show, that makes North Carolina and then secondarily Miami the keys to keeping the ACC together. Then maybe you could think about bringing Utah in if they don't want to be in the Big 12. But I, I don't think Utah is, is going to leave before they've even joined or played in the Big 12. Crazier things have happened, but I have my doubts. Drop your thoughts in the YouTube comments or hit me up on X, formerly known as Twitter, at S. McLaughlin CFP. Curious to hear what you all think. I think that Ole Miss just made another big-time move in the transfer portal. Do you think they were done with the top rank transfer portal class? They're not. That's coming up next. This episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak 
performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Ole Miss has done it again. Big portal move for Lane Kiffin and the Rebels. Stephen Willis locked on Ole Miss joining me here on the show. I had Chris Hardy uh, as the probably best available defensive lineman, maybe not the top overall guy in the portal. Ole Miss got him uh, earlier in in the cycle and Walter Nolan transferring from Texas A&M. But this is a pretty notable pickup here, Stephen. This guy was I'm almost hilariously productive last year uh, playing in Conference USA. What do you make of Chris Hardy joining that Rebels defensive line? I think he makes the defensive line more versatile. Um, you can do different stuff. You have Prince Liam on me, Ellen, to go along with Jared Ivy, and then you add this person here. You can move Ivy down there. All of a sudden, the defensive line can turn into a little bit of a Voltron a little bit, depending on what you need to do. And you can kind of ha- fill it up to your needs um, as you see fit. I mean, it's it's pretty cool. I like Chris Hardy. Him at Jacksonville State, he had eight and a half sacks, 16 and a half tackles for loss, and only four quarterback hurries, which it tells me it's like, hey, this is a guy that got home whenever he got close. It wasn't something where he almost got to the quarterback. And Chris Hardy, believe it or not, had as many sacks against SEC teams as Tyler Barrett. Which is a pretty impressive stat in and of itself. Now, I, I'm not expecting him to come into the SEC and replicate those numbers, but this is a guy who who feels like he might be the second or third best defensive line player for, for Ole Miss this year. Where do you put Ole Miss's defensive line with, with him at the helm it, compared to the rest of the SEC? Compared to the rest, rest of the SEC, like George is always going to have a bunch yeah. of animals at, at, at defensive line. Texas is good. Um, Alabama's always going to be good. Um, Jaheim Otis is a really good football player. I figure somewhere in that top tier, though, um, Walter Nolan is somebody that you just can't trifle with. Like I said, Prince Liam Amami Ellen is potentially a top half to mid-level first-round draft pick. Jared Ivey was the MVP of the Peach Bowl. And then you have J.J. Pegues, who just quietly is their all-versatile short yard or just running back because he's so athletic. So – I really like this defensive line group. And then when you look at like Chris Poupal at linebacker and the other linebackers that they have, this front seven has a chance to be different from Ole Miss teams of the past. Whenever you think of Ole Miss the last couple of years, it was all offense and just trying to outscore people. But now all of a sudden those 50 to 48 games and those 50 to 40 games, they're 50 to 20 games. And if that happens, it's going to look a whole lot differently. Ole Miss, as you mentioned, has not had a a sparkling defensive reputation over the last couple of years, shall we say. How do you feel with with not just Hardy, but the rest of the guys in there and and the entire transfer portal class writ large for Ole Miss defensively? How do you feel they're going to be different in 2024? Well, last year they they took a step defensively because they were they were dominant against bad to mid offenses. If you unless you had super athletes on offense like Georgia, like LSU, th- those guys could win one on ones with guys. The defensive scheme just completely shut people down. And after that Georgia game, after that LSU game, after a little bit of that Texas A and M game, Pete Golding realized that hey, we need guys that can match up with those guys. We, we need to win one-on-ones defensively. If that happens, our scheme's going to be exactly what we want it to be. And they used the transfer portal to make it happen. After the Georgia game, um, Lane Kiffin, the Grove Collective, everybody sat down and said, hey, we need guys that look like that. If, you, if we want to beat them, we need to look like that. And they set, a, set upon a plan right after that Georgia game to get Prince Liam on Miel and like. Um, Walter Nolan, like those type players that are really big, really athletic guys. If you even look at the offensive line, like Diego Pounds, just a huge man. Nate Kalepo from Washington, a huge man. They wanted to make the 
the lines on both lines of the scrimmage look like elite programs like Georgia, like um, Washington a year ago, like those guys. And I think the returns are the early returns that they're in pretty good shape. Now we have to see on the field, they have to mesh together. They have to win games. But luckily, if you look at Ole Miss's schedule, they've got six games to kind of work our way up into this like thing before they have to go down to Baton Rouge. And then Baton Rouge obviously is going to be a different animal, but you do have six games to get right at the beginning of the season. The other transfer Ole Miss got recently was at the running back position. Of course, Quinshawn Judkins no longer a part of Ole Miss's repertoire. He's up at Ohio State. But Rashad Amos, a guy who had transferred to Colorado, and then he didn't. And Ole Miss said, no, 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 you want to you come down here because Col- Colorado's improved, but – but Ole Miss is a playoff contender. Of course, they're one of the SEC teams favored to to make it this year. And I, I think Ole Miss is absolutely a playoff caliber team. But what do you make of the Amos addition to the backfield to join Jackson Dart and company? Well, um, Rashad Amos was necessary because of all of the weirdness happening around Ja'Cory Krosky Merritt. Um, the New, New Mexico transfer that was committed to Arizona, then he was committed to Ole Miss and ended up, I think he enrolled at Arizona, but there was questions about his eligibility. Um, and you couldn't really, it was all like, it really felt like a situation to where if you're an Ole Miss fan and you understand the scar tissue, you were just waiting. I was like, Hey, we'll have your Corey Krosky merit. And then August 20th, the NCAA shows up and says, this guy's ineligible. You can't play him. That that's kind of what they were expecting to happen. And Ole Miss needed to, protect themselves against that, honestly. And they went out and got a Rashawn Amos, a 235-pound running back, 6'2". Somebody at Miami of Ohio ran for over 1,000 yards, ran for like 180 yards in their bowl game. He he is a really good, big running back. So if you want to look at the three running backs that are slated to probably get the majority of the carries this season, you have Ulysses Bentley the fourth, who is just – and electricity, the electric factor, you might say. Um, Henry Parrish coming back to Ole Miss. He's Mr. Reliable at running back. And then now you have your thumper in Richard Amos. And this running back game is going to look a lot like it did in 2021. In 2020, whenever Ole Miss had the three-headed monster with Matt Corral. It's going to look a lot like that. But these, these are some talented dudes. And I'm really curious to kind of see them grow together. Um, because between Bentley and Parrish and Amos, they have a chance to be a for, pretty formidable backfield. We're less than 100 days away from the season in which Lane Kiffin, not entirely, but largely through the transfer portal and also key returners like Jackson Dart, ha- have set, they, they've set themselves up for some pretty high hopes. I have high hopes for them. I've been a fan of Ole Miss's offseason. It's hard to not be, frankly, but the, the entire time since I've been hosting uh, this show and – what do you make of the, the portal class as a whole? Lane Kiffin has been dubbed the portal king, and he's got the number one portal class in in the 24-7 cycle in the class of, of 2024. How has he used the transfer portal to set the stage for this upcoming season? He's used the transfer portal better than anybody else in college football, and that's over the last few years. That's not just – this year, when you look at it, you have Jackson Dart, transfer from USC. You have Ulysses Bentley IV, transfer from SMU. Um, Henry Paris Jr., transfer from Miami. Rashad Amos, transfer from Miami, Ohio. Trey Harris, um, transfer from Louisiana Tech. Juice Wells, transfer from South Carolina. The offensive line transfers all over the place. The defense has been completely rebuilt with transfers. If Ole Miss makes the playoff and makes a run, this not only turns college football on his head, but it turns what it takes to make a roster on his head. If you have a quarterback on your team that's experienced, that can be a leader of your team, then it just doesn't matter if they're all transfers. Ole Miss is doing at a 2.0 level what everybody criticized Bill Snyder for doing at Kansas State in 2000 when he was recruiting JUCO players and half of his class, three-quarters of his class were Kansas JUCOs. They said, oh, no, 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 Kansas State can't win doing this. Bill Snyder's obviously just kind of smoking mirrors. This is the 2.0 version of that. And if Lane Kiffin does what I think he is going to do this year, it's going to turn college football on his head. 
That was an exquisite piece of college football history right there. That's why we bring him on. Steven Willis, Locked on Ole Miss. Check him out on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Look at the merch he's got rolling. The mic cover, the sweatshirt. He's got absolutely everything you need for the Rebels. Steven, thanks as always. Oh, anytime, buddy. I think UCLA head coach Deshaun Foster listens to this show. I'll tell you why next. Spencer, why would you say something so ridiculous as to suggest that Deshaun Foster listens to this show or watches it on YouTube? I'd appreciate him either way. Well, the reason I make such a rhetorical statement is it seems like he's out to prove me wrong because Deshaun Foster cares not what someone like me thinks, and he's just out there making moves for this year and for the future year. So not only did he pick up John Emery, a former five-star recruit at uh, LSU, who didn't have, you know, buku numbers whilst with the Tigers, but is a guy who, when you're that highly recruited out of high school and you don't work out uh, the way you're hoping for at a big-time program like LSU, I think he battled injuries over there. Typically, you end up at a place that might be more high profile than UCLA. I'm very down on UCLA's prospects for 2024. I'm starting to warm up to the notion they could at least be respectable or competitive in 2025 and uh, beyond, or more relevant than just the consistent bottom feeder, a la you know, Maryland and Rutgers for the most part. I apologize to those two fan bases, but reality is what it is. In the Big Ten, that's kind of been the comp for UCLA is, hey, they're going to go to the Big Ten and in football, they're going to be Maryland and Rutgers. They bring in a new television market and a new fan base, but they're not actually going to make any noise. I think that's still more likely than them being towards the top of the conference with the Ohio States and Michigans and Oregons and Penn States of the world and, you know, Wisconsin and Washington and all those sorts of programs. USC, I don't know if they can get up to that level and stay there. I'm just saying that Deshaun Foster is doing a better job so far than I expected him to. So Emery's a nice pickup in the transfer portal, but Matt Niamaleava is the guy who I want to talk about because this is a 2025 four-star recruit who had some other notable schools going after him. And yes, he is the younger brother of Nico Iamaleava, who we were talking about here with Eric Kane of Locked On Vols recently on the show because he's going to be starting for Tennessee in his redshirt freshman or true sophomore campaign. I'm pretty sure he redshirted a year ago, but it's his second year of college football, and he's going to be starting at a major program that aspires to make the college football playoff. And I know this is going to shock you, but Madden Iamaleava is, like his brother, incredibly, incredibly talented. So why would he go to UCLA? That's a question that you know only Madden knows the answer to. I don't have him here, but clearly he's buying in to what Deshaun Foster is selling. Now, my understanding with this particular recruitment, there was a geographical element in that he didn't want to stray far from home. USC was not quite as interested, and so UCLA is the place where he goes. Sure, that, that could have been a part of it, but here's a list of schools that were also in the running for Matt Niamaleava. So, Michigan State with a very proven staff, another team that won't be good this year. But in the coming years, Jonathan Smith's got a pretty good track record as a head coach. Nebraska, ever heard of Matt Rule? That's a pretty big name. That's a pretty big name to throw up. Did you notice that both those schools are in the Big Ten? Uh, SMU and Tennessee are not. They're in the ACC. Don't forget that. SMU, ACC, get used to it. Tennessee, of course, in the SEC. And Matt Niamaleava is, trans or is committing to UCLA. So what you have set up here is a quarterback room that I think could have some back and forth in 2024. Ethan Garbers is the incumbent starter from a year ago, or he was you know in and out as the starter. We'll see what Demarcius Davis is able to bring to the table. He transferred down from Washington, 2024 recruit. But you're loading up the quarterback room with talent to set up a real battle in the spring of 2025. And they're starting to recruit at a level that makes you think, hey, it's it's something, right? I, I mean, it's not nothing. I'm not saying they're going to blow the doors off of anybody. Carson Cox, though, is a very impressive running back. I think he's going to be a really, really good football player for UCLA. 
And so you start to stack those pieces together, and this is when recruiting classes get built. Does every verbal commit stay committed? Nope. Do over 80 or 90% of them? Yep, absolutely. Right now, UCLA in the class of 2025 has got the number 34 recruiting class in 24-7 sports. They got a couple of blue chip guys, including Cox, and now Madden, Iamaleava, and one other as well. Then they got a handful of three-star guys. If you continue building that momentum on the recruiting trail, suddenly you could put together a top 30 or, dare I say, a top 25 class. It's not a small undertaking. It's not a quick process to turn around a college football program, especially one that is number two in its own city. UCLA is second to USC. That's just the reality when you're talking football. If we're talking basketball, you flip those things around. Bruins going into next year, big expectations in the Big Ten. USC, not so much. They got Eric Musselman coming over. Anyway, this is a Locked On College football podcast, not Locked On College basketball, but check out Andy Patton and Isaac Shade if you're interested. Those guys do an utterly fantastic job covering the sport, just like we cover Locked On College football here on the show. So bringing this back to Deshaun Foster, I have compared him in the past to Jed Fish because when Jed Fish was at Arizona, he came into a program that was in complete and utter disarray, far worse than what Deshaun Foster's taking over, though certainly he does not have an easy situation to work with. But he's going to need a few years, and this is how you would like to see it start. Get a major quarterback recruit. I think about what, what stamp with Troy Taylor coming in from Sacramento State, they weren't very good last year. But you know what they did? They started recruiting at a pretty solid level. Top 20, top 30-ish sort of range, according to 24-7 Sports. They got Elijah Brown, highly touted 2024 true freshman incoming. He's going to probably battle for the starting quarterback job. That's the quarterback from modern day. That guy usually gets poached somewhere else. Matt Niamaleava, also coming from a big school, Warren High School down in the Southern California area. And, well, guess what? He's going to UCLA, and it just kind of turns their head and makes you go, what? But the Jed Fish comparison is one of which he comes in, or he came into Arizona, they went 1-11 in his first year. Disregard. Then they pulled in a top 20 recruiting class. It was top 20 most of the time, top 25. Way better than what they should have been, and suddenly they turn things around. And we'll see what sort of recruiting momentum Deshaun Foster picks up. And as I mentioned earlier, I do not expect UCLA to be a conference contender. I do not expect them to recruit at a top 10, 15 level. But if you start recruiting at a top 20 level, top 15 to 20 level, that is going to change the floor for your program going into the Big Ten. You're going up against some heavy hitters. So you got to be able to hit the trail. You got to bring in high profile players. And when you watch Madden Niamaleava throw the ball, yeah, he looks a lot like his brother. He's very tall, six foot three, pretty skinny, only about a buck 85. But playing quarterback to him looks very easy. He throws the ball, drops in the bucket. He's got a beautiful deep ball. He throws an incredibly catchable football. And yeah, it reminds you a lot of his brother who's going to start at Tennessee. So if you're bringing in that caliber of player, by the time he's starting, which maybe it'd be his true freshman year in 2025, maybe it's his redshirt freshman or sophomore year in 2026, that'd be the best starting quarterback that UCLA would would, would have or would have had, will have had, English is weird, since Dorian Thompson Robinson, because last year was a mess. Dante Moore wasn't ready to go, and that's the other thing that that has to make you feel good if you're a Bruins fan here. There's no hurry for Sean Foster. You're in the Big Ten. You got a full media right share. So as long as the administration and the fans buy into what you're doing, like right now, All Deshaun Foster needs to be doing is selling culture, selling the Bruins. That's what he's got to do. He doesn't have to go out and win a lot of games this year. I don't think he has to win a lot of games next year. He's just got to make people believe that he can build something if given time and if he's able to get the right sorts of players. And these are the sorts of markers I look at and go, man, I didn't think he'd be doing this well right now. And yet here he is. He was handed a pretty tough situation, and right now he's making the most of it. We'll see how they look this year. Eric Bieniemy is their offensive coordinator. Yes, that Eric Bieniemy. Just just remember that, and we'll see how he works with with Matt Niamaleava when he arrives, and how he works with Demarcius Davis and, and Ethan Garbers, and how everything looks. But 
This year, no pressure for UCLA. Win four games, hey, I think that'd be great. Win five, outstanding, he's better than I thought. I am still not sold on Deshaun Foster bringing UCLA into the top of the conference, but he's got the building blocks here of showcasing that he can recruit in a way that Chip Kelly did not, and that's something. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time, and until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.